So good afternoon and welcome to everybody. Um, so annually in collaboration with Wavescape Surf and Ocean Festival, Wavescape's Film and uh, Media Promotion Unit hosts the Blue Ocean Masterclass. This year, the Masterclass will drive awareness to the film industry's journey to eco-friendly film, uh, eco film sets to drive conservation. This webinar will feature a number of speakers and climate change activists from organizations such as the Sea Change Project, Habitat XR, Rap Zero, Green Set, and Ocean Pledge. So before I introduce our first speaker, I would like to explain some house rules. If you have any questions, you'll see at the bottom, there's a Q&A box. Please type your questions in the Q&A box. And after all our presenters have delivered the awesome presentations, we will then refer to the Q&A box. We'll go through each question and we will ask our presenters to answer them. So please do stay for the Q&A session afterwards. So first up, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker for the day from Rapsido. So Liesl spent the last seven years of her journalism career at the helm of Earthworks, SA's only publication dedicated to, stay in a, to, uh, dedicated to sustainability in the built environment. After witnessing and contributing towards the shift um, in responsible practices and procedures in the construction industry, she now applies tested project management skills, endless optimization, and an extensive professional network as a sustainability practitioner dedicated to the sustainability in the film industry. So welcome, Liesl. I will stop my, uh, sharing my screen now, and then you can bring your presentation up. Okay. Hi, thanks for that introduction, Lisa. I'm very pleased to be here um, and also to be sharing this, the panel with so, so many great people and who are doing so many important um, things. This is really important work and, um, and yeah, hopefully I'm looking forward to really engaging with this audience as well. I think there's a lot that, that we can learn from each other and I'm really keen to see and hear your inputs as well. Um, so let me just quickly get my presentation going. And let's get going. Okay, so I'm from Rap Zero. We are an all women sustainability consultancy and all four of us have got very deep experience in sustainability from different industries. And for the past three and a half years now, we've been focusing specifically on the film, in, well, media industry. So film, TV, um, and commercials. And our focus is really to close the gap between policy practice and people. Um, if we look at where we are at the moment as, as, you know, as a planet, this is a very recent quote by the UN Secretary General. To put it simply, the state of the planet is broken. Humanity is waging war on nature. This is suicidal. Um, if we I'm not actually gonna go into the detail of this slide. I think the picture speaks for itself. I think, I believe the people who are here are already pretty aware of, of where we're at um, and the urgency of what we need to do. I do wanna highlight though, the one thing that carbon emissions are at record highs and that people of color and poor communities are actually the most at risk of the impacts of climate change and the climate emergency. Because of this audience, I wanted to dig in specifically a little bit about oceans, the ocean's dilemma, and also response, you know, the opportunities that come out of that. So 83% of the global carbon cycle is circulated through marine waters. High CO2 levels cause acidification, deoxygenation and rising temperatures. And there's so many knock on effects from that. Um, from biodiversity and species loss to rising, um, you know, uh, loss of sea ice, which then causes rising sea levels and uh, threats to coastal communities. Then there's pollution. Every minute a truck full of waste ends up in the ocean. By 2030, we're looking at two trucks per minute. And already 90% of large fish have been caught. 
and that's only in the last 50 years. Um, and this year, more than 80% of oceans experience marine heat waves, and we anticipate that we'll have no Arctic ice in, it, in summer by 2040. And I think this really speaks for itself. But there's also huge potential if we can get this right, if we can manage it properly, um, there's a lot that oceans can contribute towards the regeneration of Earth as well. So it can contribute up to 21% of carbon emissions reductions that's needed by 2050. It can produce 40 times more renewable energy than what was generated in 2018. It can produce six times more sustainable seafood, sustain 12 million jobs and deliver $15.5 trillion in net economic benefits. And what do we need to get there? We need very strong policies and we need to protect at least 30% of oceans. Now, the good news is quite recently, 14 countries actually committed to doing that. And obviously they are working hard to get more signatories. So um, yeah, good to have some good news there. But again, this is at a global level. And if we take a step back and we look at, we've started with the UN, so let's close the section with the UN as well. If we look at their top action list, there's really three things that we need to focus on globally. And the first is to align global finance with the Paris Agreement or the, you know, the objectives of the Paris Agreement. The second is to adapt to protect the world's most vulnerable communities and countries from climate impacts. And then also to achieve global carbon neutrality within the next three decades. Um, and I assume most people here are aware of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but if not, that's a really good place to kick off to sort of also get your head around the, the positive side of what can be done um, in order to turn this crisis around. But you might be thinking, what's the film got to do with all of this? So again, I think this audience is familiar with, with issues, with addressing issues. It's, it's known as a critical lens and a, and a cultural compass. It's known for, for being, act, being activism, for activism, for being challenging and inquiring and also educational and aspirational. Um, and, it's, and importantly, it, it knows that its content can provide opportunity for behavioral change. But it's important to understand that that can both happen from the content on screen as well as your actions behind the scenes during your production. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting. Ah, there we go. So if we're looking behind the scenes, we do need to look at the carbon footprint of productions. And now, there's a very well known and often repeated stat that global broadcast production emissions is actually equivalent to that of the global aviation industry emissions, which we all know is massive. And if you think of all those flights every day, maybe not this year, but as a rule, um, all day, every day around the world, that is food for thought. Um, and it's really important therefore, we know that every industry needs to step up. So this is the same for the media production industry. As a consultancy, our targets are to work with our clients to achieve zero waste to landfill, zero food waste, zero carbon footprint, and zero water waste. Um, and to also maximize the positive impact. So over three and a half years of being, of being practicing and also being part of a global community of practitioners and exchanging ideas and experiences there, what have we learned in terms of the impact of productions? Um, so we, one of the things that we've done um, is work with the KwaZulu Natal Film Commission. They were actually the first region to step up and say, okay, we're gonna take this seriously. Um, and we commit, firstly, we did the first ever baseline study for them on the resource use, use and carbon footprint of different types of productions in their province. Um, and then follow, following on from that, we developed guidelines that are, that are, and both of these documents are available on our website as well as the KZN Film Commission's website. Now, as part of that, we did, we did, we, we measured three long form productions. So that's Izalo, which is a soapy, a long running soapy, Kings of Mulberry, which was a feature, a local feature film, 
and the widow, we only measured the KZN on location part of that production. It was an international co-production. So as you can see here, there's a huge range or, uh, you know, in terms of carbon footprinting, in terms of what, so this is, we've broken this down per broadcast minute. There are so many variables. Um, and I think what's, uh, as you can see there, it, 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 it can really range. Um, if we then go to, on the right here, I've got a stat there from Albert Plus. So Albert Plus is the UK's official tool, carbon measurement tool for media. Um, they have over the last year in their most recent annual report announced that they've achieved um, in the productions that they actually measure or that report into them a 10% reduction in carbon emissions per hour. So they've gone from, um, they've gone down to 153 kilometer, uh, kilograms carbon emissions equivalent per broadcast minute. So that 153 would then compare with um, Kings of Mulberry at 545. Now there's a few things to remember, because it sounds like ours are very high, but there's, there's a lot of things to remember when you try and compare. There's no single standard tool at the moment that's used around the world. Um, what we found working with different tools is that there are also gaps in what they measure. They are, for example, they, they don't measure um, water or things like polyurethane, which on a, on a, on a, on a production like uh, The Widow may, or Kings of Mulberry or anything like that might actually make a very big impact. Um, then the other, the other thing to remember is the quality of data that's submitted can have a massive impact on your end result in terms of your carbon footprint. Um, and very often these are submitted by people who are very pushed for time. Um, so it's like coordinators that are already burdened with a lot of, a lot of other tasks. So, but this gives you an idea of what we've come across. I mean, we've seen this go up um, a lot higher even than what, we've, than, than what these figures are for local productions. But then if you're, if you're running a production, where do you actually start? I think again, going back to Albert, they do have some great tools and resources. And one of it is a creative guide to putting the planet into program editorial. And it's called Planet Placement. And really what it comes back to is how do you approach this in terms of your content? You raise the issues. So that's kind of almost the, you know, the challenging part of it or the activism part of it. But then there's also showing the actions. And that really comes down to, to posit showcasing positive examples, showing people that it is, it's not rocket science necessarily. Um, there's a lot that can be done that's actually quite basic and that will be that's being done by people around the world. So it really is it's, it's about making it every day, making those positive actions everyday actions. Then if we look at how we've been measuring uh, productions as well, we can maybe ch just chat through a few um, a few high impact areas so and, and they're not all relevant to dockies. If you look at, but what we have seen is that flights, freight and accommodation are quite often ones that are particularly relevant to documentary filmmaking. Um, accommodation, something that you can consider, for example, is to always try and book with an accommodation establishment that's got a green accreditation or at least request their sustainability policy. Even if they don't have it, the fact that you request it raises that in their minds as something that people might want in future and might actually help prompt them to go and commit to that. Flights, for example, um, the more direct the route and the fewer landings and takeoffs, the less fuel that it burns. And then also class is a factor. So, so you know, business class obviously has a much higher carbon footprint than economy class, for example. Um, transport, you're not gonna be hiring any vehicles uh, or you should hire vehicles that are fit for purpose. So, so as small as possible and as fuel efficient as possible. Uh, also plan your trips, try and combine trips and, um, and reduce your travel as much as possible. And if you can go for um, hybrid vehicles uh, or even EV, depending on where you're shooting, it's not necessarily the best option in South Africa because our, our electricity, it depends how it's charged, our electricity is very dirty. 
terms of catering, the focus should really be on local, seasonal, seasonal, fresh, um, and then very importantly, no palm oil in prep. Um, and also meat free as much as possible. That has a huge impact too. Also consider how it's packaged, um, preferably if you have, uh, if you are going to be doing composting with your waste, try and get biodegradable packaging and make sure that it then goes to composting. Printing, I think everybody's um, gotten on board with that, that you need to print as little as possible. Digital is always better. Um, then energy efficiency, LEDs obviously are a huge um, factor nowadays. It's not always suitable for outdoor shooting, but we've seen examples on set where they've made huge energy savings as well as financial savings by going uh, switching to LEDs or, uh, or at least a, a large part of the kit. Uh, waste reduction is massive. It starts with eco procurement though. What you buy, you buy your waste. So think very carefully about what you buy. Um, and then also think very carefully about how you can separate and make sure you have the right service providers to actually close the loop for you. Make sure they can report into you so that you know that it's actually happened as well. Uh, and check in with them when you're procuring things if you're not sure, make sure that they can actually handle those things, those items. Water conservation, I'm not even gonna go because I think we're all um, pretty aware of that, especially in Cape Town. And then I think again in South Africa, we are very aware of the potential for social, the positive impact in terms of social development and economic development. So I'm not going to say too much about that, aside from the fact that it really is an opportunity um, to leverage the impact of your film, for example, for that bigger social impact. But I think we see that a lot um, in this community, in this audience. Then I've just sort of had a chat to some of my colleagues internationally to just get an idea of, of where dockies, where and how dockies are different. Uh, I think the first thing is that they're often already very deeply engaged with content. They often have smaller budgets, crews, technical and creative requirements. So that already reduces your carbon footprint and your resource use. Highest impacts are usually from flights and especially freight because we understand or understand that, that um, teams tend to overpack equipment just for emergency backup because they don't always know what's available on the other side if they're traveling. Um, and that can push up the emissions from freight actually to be much higher than even the flights. Um, they usually have a smaller footprint, but the really big shows such as, for example, the natural history shows that might be in production for two years and shoot all over the world, well, they actually can have much bigger than, than, than drama, for example. Um, using archive stock is one way to cut production costs and carbon emissions. But on the other hand, we've also seen how the high definition processing that's happening nowadays, as well as storage, really in can increase emissions from post-production. And now I'm really keen to hear from everybody else. Thank you. Uh, let me just stop here. Thank you, Liesl. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very interesting, but I think I will keep our questions for later. Sure. So next up, we have Cindy. And Cindy is the operations manager at GreenSet, um, which is a nonprofit film industry sustainability organization. She holds a higher certificate in film and television production from AFTA and has recently completed the Al Gore Climate Reality Leadership Training. Her journey with CleanSet began in 2019 as the eco steward under the guidance of consultants Rap Zero on the Ridley Scott sci fi series called Days by Wolves. Her core function was to work with the crew on a daily basis to minimize the environmental impact and carbon footprint of the production. So welcome, Cindy. Um, we're looking forward to hearing your story. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, Belinda's going to start off uh, sharing a video that has been quite impactful on set uh, because we are basically green ambassadors and our aim is to make sure that every crew member understands their potential impact and how they can reduce their carbon footprint and environmental impact. Go ahead, Belinda. Thanks, let me just share my screen. Mm -hmm. So, 
sorry guys, just trying to find my, I'm uh, just having a little bit of trouble sharing the screen. Sorry, just give us a sec. No worries, just press share screen and don't forget to tick the little box for share my computer sound. Okay. You can't start sharing your video because the host has stopped it, it says, Lise. Stop. Let me just try, try again. There we go. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes, but there's no sound, so just go back to share screen and click on share computer sound. Okay, I think the sound is coming in now. Can you hear that? The first thing you'll notice is a river flowing from this mountain directly. Still no sound, guys. There's sound. There's sound. So maybe you can just start from the beginning, please. Thank okay. you. I'm going to back it up. I live in Cape Town, South Africa, home to the famous Table Mountain. But there's another mountain growing here that nobody seems to see. The first thing you'll notice is a river flowing from this mountain directly into the ocean. The next thing is this row of trucks, about 34 today. These trucks contain Cape Town's garbage. As far as I can tell, these trucks line up here almost every day of the year. They drive to the top of the mountain, they dump our garbage, and they cover with earth. So far, this mountain is the size of 105 rugby fields. Growing bigger and bigger. We can stop this mountain growing further is to open our eyes and reduce our waste now. Thank you for that. Now let me share my screen and tell you a little bit about Green Set and what we do and how we're doing it and the green team we're building one eco steward at a time. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you, Cindy. All right, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. As Lisa so generously introduced myself, uh, I'm Cindy Mkonazi, currently Operations Manager at Greenset, a nonprofit film industry sustainability organization. Now, the world has been reimagined and we're shaping sustain a sustainable future for the South African film industry and hopefully everyone here and the rest of the world can be part of it. Now this calls for a bold new strategic operational approach to a triple bottom line in our businesses. So that means taking into account people, profits and the planet. Now Greenset has been working with producers locally to minimize and calculate the carbon footprint of productions and to also just try and implement practical economical green initiatives um, through employing green set eco stewards on all of their jobs. Now environmental sustainability is an area where you know there's a lot of room for growth and what we do as green set is mainly to just look for passionate people young people who study environmental sustainability at UWC, CPUT, and then train them in order to understand the link between environmental sustainability and the film industry. Now, what we've done is created a handbook, which basically just shows them how to implement green initiatives. So basically taking what they've learned at university and applying it into the film industry, the book that we've developed is called a green set, uh, green set Intern Handbook. And then we also have accredited um, work skills programs. So the first one we did was actually with Rab Zero. It's an NQF level four qualification. So when we get eco stewards to apply at green set, they do the handbook and the NQF level four qualification. And we are in the process of developing an NQF level five qualification, which will be beneficial to any matriculates who have free time during that gap year. They could come into Greenset 
work on set and perhaps decide to study environmental sustainability and thus you know growing our pool of passionate environmentalists who can be placed in the film industry to make it green and um, after working on raised by wolves last year a really big pain point is waste management on set because of time constraints and just generally speaking um, waste service providers tend to require more static businesses and the film industry will have different locations. So lugging waste around in order for it to be composted and recycled can pose a bit of a challenge. And we've created a position that can hopefully close that gap between the film industry and waste management. This is called a green PA. So the green PA will be trained by us um, as well as any partnering waste service provider in order to know what to do with the waste. And they'll also have um, a vehicle in order to transport the waste and hopefully work with GreenSet in order to find ways to make money using the waste that is generated on set. Because um, a lot of the waste does not necessarily have to go to landfill. We can divert it through a buyback system or through repurposing or even reselling. It depends on the production, basically. And now I will link to the production team. So GreenSet has mainly worked with Albert Plus and the Green Production Guide. So we always make sure that our GreenSet eco stewards are able to use either one of those tools. And for local um, productions or commercials, we've designed our own little way of operating which then becomes the green set environmental sustainability tool, which we call the guest. Now, let me tell you about our carbon calculator. Now, as, as Liesl uh, mentioned, global carbon calculators sometimes aren't applicable and their coefficients don't exactly work for South Africa. For example, the carbon footprint for beef is a lot higher abroad than it is here. So if we're using their emission factors, then it might not lead to the most accurate carbon footprint calculation. And that's where we got Credible Carbon to step in. Now, Credible Carbon are scientists who have the carbon register in South Africa. So we worked with them in order to develop a carbon calculator which basically serves to demystify carbon footprinting because a lot of the questions that I got from SET was, but how does this work? What does this mean? How accurate is this? And we designed this calculator to just be a starting point to get people to understand like volumes and what it means to eat less meat through seeing how much carbon footprint emissions are avoided by having a meat-free Monday. So this calculator is very simple to use and the departments that we are measuring are catering, film and unit transport, the construction department, set decoration, costume and wardrobe, lighting, travel and accommodation, post-production, recycling, as well as COVID. So let me tell you a little bit about the COVID measuring of um, the environmental impact. So needless to say, production spend has gone up and their carbon footprint also has gone up because of COVID-19. So we worked with a few producers this year and the question that they kept on asking was, how are we going to speak on the impact of COVID? Because our carbon footprint is a bit higher. We're using more resources, but can we quantify the impact and because Credible Carbon are, are experts in their field, they helped us to be able to quantify that. So at the end of the productions we worked on this year, we can not only report on waste, water, construction, we can also report on the impact of COVID-19. And now for the team. So as I said in the beginning, um, I've been working closely with UWC, CPT, UCT, just to make sure that we are able to tap in to the youth of South Africa, because we have people who are studying industrial revolution, environmental sustainability, whether it be water, geoscience, and a lot of them weren't even aware that the film industry in South Africa is going green. 
So we showed them this opportunity and they jumped for it. <laughs> so we're slowly building a team of green eco stewards who are able to work with either myself or other consultants, because the main aim of what Green City is doing is to make sure that every job that lands in South Africa or any job filmed here has an eco steward who, would, who will conscientize people about their impact and what they can do because the production teams normally are a little bit short staffed and pressed for time. So a production coordinator won't necessarily have all the time to measure the carbon footprint, to send out messaging, to encourage people to take part in the initiatives. So we are basically there to keep the momentum going and to make sure that everyone is informed. Now, let me show you the 2020 Eco Stewards. So we have Humutsu Mashiho. He studied at UWC and is very passionate about the environment. And he worked with uh, Advantage Entertainment on a production called Afterlife of the Party, where we help them achieve a gold seal. Now a gold seal is um, a stamp of approval given by the Green Production Guide and the EMA. So big ups to him for doing that. And then we also have Zusi Pekapa, also studied at UWC, Geography and Environmental Studies to be in particular. And he is currently working on his master's and hopefully he'll be moving on with us and growing and making the industry green. And then we have Caitlin Thomas, who studied at Stellenbosch University. And basically her passion is to work on reducing waste to landfall when it comes to the construction department, because the construction department has one of the biggest impacts when it comes to waste, because a lot of the materials that they use are unsustainable or difficult to repurpose or recycle. And of course, over here, we have Around the World in 80 Days, where we worked with Esperanza, who is also doing her master's in environmental sustainability. And then The Watch, Sandy Ntimbi, studied environmental sustainability at CPUT. And then Elizabeth Meyerberg as well, who was one of the first eco stewards to join Greenset back in 2018. She worked on Noughts and Crosses, which is currently being featured on the Albert Plus website uh, because she did a good job and they also received a three-star rating. And over here, Raised by Wolves, which helped birth me in environmental sustainability. I worked with uh, Liesl and Grace from Rap Zero. So basically, uh, Liesl and Grace helped to pass the torch on to me and Basically, my job is to make sure that the team is growing. Within a few years, it will be the norm to have someone on a production that will be specifically dedicated to environmental sustainability. And then Luto from Stellenbosch and SCP from CPUT. The team is growing, <laughs> what can I say? And this is great because when we first started, I mean, I, I was one of the first eco stewards last year, and now we have a team of 15. So slowly but surely, we, we are growing our numbers. And just to touch on the type of material that we cover when we are doing our training, we make sure that whatever sustainability tool is mandated by the production, that our eco stewards are well trained on it and able to implement and achieve the deliverables set out by the producers. And now a very important part of what we do is mobilizing young people of South Africa within the circular economy. So this basically means creating little inserts and little videos to promote young South Africans who work within the circular economy and we recently did a video for Luvu Yondiki, Red Cup Village, and he is piloting or already operating a 3D printer, which prints biodegradable packaging and is hoping to move on to print biodegradable PPE maybe, or any sort of items that 
generate waste within the film industry. And hopefully he can use his qualification in industrial designing in order to, you know, just find greener solutions, find solutions that aren't linear because the buzzword is circular economy. And we aim to promote that through um, finding employment for young people within the circular economy in the film industry and helping those who want to make a real impact. Belinda, can you please play the video? Just uh, to show you Red Cup Village. I think you need to stop sharing your screen, Cindy, and then I can uh, share mine. Okay. No, it's not allowing me to. Oh, well, there, there we go. Hello. Yeah, not allowing me to share because it says another par participant is sharing. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. Yes, we can, Belinda. You can just make it big and. Yeah. There we go. Yet everyone every day goes to town and just goes across this plastic, especially growing as a person growing up in the township. And it's always been something that's been bothering me as well as, a, as an individual. Experiences around plastic specifically. Um, I think one of the things that actually highlights it plastic to me is when we had one of our family cows um, that passed away because it ate plastic. Hi guys. I always had to take care of what's outside. Hi, Lisa. I don't know why I've just popped up because of my video is off. Let me just. Yeah, it's quite long. So we just thought we'd show you the intro to it. And uh, everybody can go over to the Quiet City page uh, and take a look at it. It's it's five minutes. And I think we've probably used more than our, our 20 minutes that have been allocated. So we just wanted to show you the, the introduction to that. Yes. And. Um... The reason we do inserts such as these is because um, it comes with opportunities that they might not have been able to access um, without exposure that we help them to get. For example, uh, Red, Red Cup Village actually received funding because um, someone saw their video and a company reached out to him and he was able to purchase more 3D printers to print more biodegradable products. So that's what we aim to do, promote young people in South Africa who are in the circular economy and make sure that they are able to find employment within the film industry. And that's it for Green Set. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy and Belinda. That was very informative and you guys are doing amazing work. I mean, I don't know about the rest of the audience, but I've already jotted down a few questions that we'll get to later. Um, so thanks, Cindy. I'm going to call Fane up next. Um, I think in September, I think it was the 7th of September, everybody was waiting for an octopus teacher to, uh, to screen on Netflix. I know I was one of those people. I know I was uh, one of those that watched and cried and resonated so much with a uh, with a beautiful uh, film. So um, Fane is a filmmaker, a storyteller, and environmentalist working with the Sea Change Project, uh, with Wayscape Festival, and with GoPro South Africa. She has also spent several years committed to learning in nature with a focus on the kelp forests along the Cape Peninsula. Her focus is on stories, telling stories that reconnect people to nature, inspire curiosity, and foster compassion. 
Fane will be speaking about the nature, uh, speaking about nature as a seat and low pack info, uh, low pack form making and referencing, referencing her own form called Azi Az Lali and experience as a production, a production assistant on My Octopus Teacher. So welcome, Fane. We're looking forward to hearing your uh, story and your journey. Well, thanks so much, Lisa. It's really, really cool to be here. And yeah, hi to everyone. And thank you so much to guess, Wavescape and Ruesco for hosting this uh, important con uh, conversation. Um, I'm just gonna pull up my slides so long. Uh, share, okay. So um, Lisa gave an introduction to me as she said, I'm a filmmaker and environmental storyteller um, working with Sea Change Project. Um, sea Change Project was uh, or is a nonprofit organization that was started by Craig Foster and Russ Freilink in 2012. And essentially its mission is to use storytelling as a tool for ocean conservation. Um, as I guess an interesting segue into the theme of today's discussion and a bit of background into me, I studied screen production at the University of Cape Town. And out of the three years that I was there, perhaps one of the most powerful things that I heard in my time were a series of statistics that were shared with us during one of our courses. And that statistic was that in Los Angeles, Hollywood or the film industry was the largest contributor to pollution topped only by the petroleum industry. So this means that it produced more emissions than aerospace manufacturing, than uh, the apparel industry, than um, hotel industries, which are all massive, massive industries in LA. Um, along with this statistic, uh, we were also shared a stat about UK television in which it was shared that for a single hour of UK TV, whether it's non-fiction or fiction, approximately 13 metric tons of carbon dioxide is produced. And to put that into perspective, that is what a single, or like the average usage for an individual for an entire year. So these statistics were in my mind and it was kind of hugely shocking and surprising, but Around the same time that that was happening and I was studying at UCT, I started receiving mentorship from Craig Foster, who I guess everyone will know through my activist teacher and maybe through his earlier documentary film work like The Great Dance. But Craig was doing something that was totally different to the industry standard for filmmaking. Um, it was at that time that he was working, for, on, working on a shoot for Blue Planet 2 which I gather has actually produced a lot of emissions. But in his particular episode, he had an extremely small crew. It consisted only of three people, himself, Roger Harax, um, who's an incredible underwater cinematographer based here in Cape Town. And then John Chambers from the UK, who was responsible for directing that particular story. And so, Generally speaking, for documentary filmmaking, a small crew isn't necessarily something that is like pioneering or unusual. Um, when you're making natural history documentary uh, uh, films, um, having a small crew is actually often very beneficial or advantageous. But what was pioneering and unusual was the manner in which Craig was interacting with this environment and how he'd learned to immerse himself in this environment. Um, uh, so Craig, prior to this, had been dive, diving almost every single day for the past six years. Um, and he'd been doing this without a wetsuit, uh, without scuba gear, so he was free diving. And he was doing it with only a tiny camera about that size. So. He had this incredible commitment to learning and understanding and creating a deep relationship with wilderness that allowed them to see and capture some of the most extraordinary uh, behaviors and species. Um, and what I came to understand was that he'd managed to cross a kind of bridge 
um, into a space where he was no longer intrusive to the environment, but had realized or had uh, come to see himself as a part of the environment and that his filmmaking and his photography was an expression of that or an extension of that. Um, he knew and understood how to move through the environment and he understood the system, the, the cult virus, the, the species, and so knew how best to interact with it, even with cameras. And for me, this was hugely exciting. Um, and I started to spend all my free time free diving and learning from Craig. And part of this involved learning how to track animals underwater. So learning about your environment and, and learning and how to track and understand how the system works is hugely important in terms of finding your stories and figuring out what stands out and what's unusual and, and where a specific story could lie. And along with that, I was honing my skills as a freediver, learning how to move with the environment, and then learning how to use smaller cameras to capture um, incredible footage that, yeah, that could work for something like a Netflix film. And so over the next four years, I watched and assisted in a, I guess, very minor role as a production assistant on My Octopus Teacher. And through this came to understand what true impact, uh, low impact filmmaking could look like. So this film was obviously being made for Netflix, which is one of or oh, the biggest streaming platform in the world. But for the most part, the entire production, and I'm not including well, aspects of post-production included a lot more people, but for most of it, it's only included Craig uh, Pepe who was the director, and then Roger Harrix. And in filming this documentary, they would frequently walk to their dive sites, cycle, or in some cases drive, but it wouldn't be more than five kilometers. Um, from there, they get into the water and they literally have the minimal amount of gear. It was no wetsuits, no scuba tanks, um, apart from Roger Harris, who would uh, be shooting on the red and then actually needed that. But uh, so many of the scenes were actually not shot on crazy, hectic equipment. Um, a lot of it was shot on super small cameras. And this would then be brought back to Craig's house where would be dumped into uh, like storage and edited right in Craig's attic. So, so basically this Netflix film was edited in the roof of Craig's house. And for me, this was just like an example of the incredible power of telling a story from one's own backyard and from a place that one truly understands. So, why uh, why they ended up using or not using these sort of high quality cameras as often is because these smaller cameras could get into spaces where a red with a massive rig couldn't. Um, as a personal example, when I interact with these uh, spotted gully sharks, if I take a big camera rig, so something that's about that wide and move into the space, my movement totally changes. I don't have the freedom that I usually have. And this camera is also emitting higher um, frequencies of like electrical impulses. So the way the sharks respond to me when I'm in this environment is totally different and they become super skittish and it's basically impossible to get close to them. But when I'm moving with something like a small camera, I have the most incredible encounters with them, with them literally brushing past me, brushing past the camera. And so the idea that one necessarily has to have a bigger, more expensive camera doesn't necessarily always mean that one's going to get better footage or be able to tell a better story. Um, back to the idea of telling a story from your backyard, what I came to understand was that with patient observation, stories exist everywhere. It doesn't require flying to exotic locations. 
in most cases, the most exotic stories lie right under our noses. And by having access to one's location, one not only reduces carbon footprint, but one truly gets to immerse oneself and understand and deepen the story that one tells. So that it becomes something that actually expresses authenticity and that can really add some kind of value to the world. Um, and I don't say this lightly, uh, I've been kind of responsible for managing how of sea changes social media over this period of the launch of my activist teacher. And the responses that we've received have just been overwhelming. We've received thousands upon thousands upon thousands of messages. And these haven't just been like one liners or even th three lines. It's been paragraphs long about um, how people have felt changed and inspired by the film, how people have literally quit jobs, changed jobs, stopped uh, eating certain foods, um, totally changed their lifestyles, uh, how it's pulled them out of depression even. So it's been insane to see and hear these responses to this film. Um, so this all helped me as I continued my personal film journey. Um, after nearly four years of diving in the kelp forest every day, uh, I started to really get a sense for how the system was working. And this allowed me to be able to notice when something seemed different or out of place or unusual. And it was this that allowed me to uncover behavior that had never previously been documented before. Um, and this became the subject of a short film that I produced earlier this year after winning a pitch for a grant at the Nature Environment Wildlife Film Congress. It features a dark shy shark and sea urchins, which are probably two creatures that people are unlikely to A, have ever heard of or B, really care about. But I hoped to provide some insight um, to share how fascinating these creatures really were and how intricate and complex even the smallest creatures' lives are. Um, the initial idea for this film came from noticing that a live shy shark egg attached to the top of a sea urchin. Um, it was a kind of anomaly that I, you know, that immediately stood out for me and raised several qu questions in my mind. Um, the first being, why was it there? Uh, would the shark survive? And what was the nature of the relationship between the shark and the sea urchin? Um, and as I started to apply myself to it, I learned that these urchins have extremely complex behaviors known um, as armoring. So they appear to be super boring and sessile, but they actually have these crazy wriggly tube feet with octopus-like suckers at the end that they use to pick up debris around them um, and place it on top of their fragile spines. And this is then used as an additional layer of um, protection from swell or for, from predators. And I learned that these shy shark eggs would frequently become detached from the substrate that they were laid to. And this would leave them essentially free floating across the seafloor and make them particularly vulnerable to predation and to being washed up. But in rare moments and total chance encounters, these eggs' lives would be brought together with the lives of sea urchins. And these urchins would actually raise these eggs on top of their, um, on, on top of their uh, spines. And this would act as a form of protection for the urchin, but also as a form of uh, stability for the shark egg. And so for months, I followed this process until eventually I was lucky enough to actually film the hatching of a dark shy shark on top of a sea urchin, um, which was super exciting and took basically months of sleeping, dreaming, uh, constantly thinking sharks and urchins. Um, virtually the entirety of my film was shot on a small point and shoot camera with reasonably decent macro capabilities. And then it was edited on my laptop. I had no crew apart from my DOP, who's an experienced freediver. Um, 
everything was shot on a single breath. So there were no tanks, no wetsuits in temperatures often as cold as um, nine degrees. And then the soundtrack was a super important aspect of my film. Um, and that was produced by a team in Johannesburg, but there was no travel involved with that. All communication was done entirely via WhatsApp. So it literally involved the minimal amount of traveling. And in the end, I think what I hoped to convey or at least allude to through the story that I was telling was the incredible sacredness of nature, um, the dance of life and death, and the fact that connection and respect was possible anywhere. And I think that an important part of honoring that story is in living it too. So the way it was filmed became super important, um, ensuring that my impact on the space that I loved and the, the space that I respected, um, ensuring that that my impact there was minimal and that uh, it respected the environment was super important. Um, I think maybe to end off on a more philosophical approach, uh, I think we live in a world that is driven by hyper-consumerism and we have a kind of constant and endless stream of content being pushed out. Um, and with this, sort of constant, highly pressurized drive to produce. It's almost like we're producing for the sake of producing and consuming for the sake of consuming. And this is leaving very little time and space to actually create content that is meaningful. Um, and we also have very little time to actually engage with content that's meaningful. So for me, there's an aspect to low impact filmmaking that comes through in choosing how we tell stories and what stories to tell. Um, so that the, the stories we tell are done in a way that is filmed in a low impact way, but that will have a high impact, uh, I guess, um, impact in terms of behavioral change. Um, yeah, it's literally about making every single shot that one shoots and every single bit of editing that one does and traveling, etc., making it count and not indulging in uh, the excessiveness that we've somehow become accustomed to in, I guess, our modern way of living. So, yeah, that is my, I guess, talk. <laughs> Thank you, Fane. You guys are doing absolutely amazing work. Um, I mean, your imagery and your photography is just absolutely incredible. There's just no other, I mean, I'm, I'm a loss for words. There's no way to describe. It's just beautiful. And so we are certainly looking forward to seeing your film on screen. Um, any indication of when to expect it? Well, it's actually, it's available on DSTV at the moment. So. Okay. I think on People's Weather, it's available on Catch Up, up on the DST. Can you put all the details in the chat for us? Yeah. Put all the details in the chat I for us. I can do that. Okay, cool. I can do that, sure. Thank you so cool. much. Thanks. Okay, Thank so much. we've Thank got you. a... You're welcome. So okay. we've got a slight uh, program change. We, we're going to bring up Ayaka um, next. Um, so a little bit about Ayaka. She's a young Cape Town-based award-winning climate justice activist. From Eerste River in Cape Town, she joined Greta Thunberg and 14 other climate activists around the world in signing a legal complaint with the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child. They also pitched a documentary called The House is Burning, a documentary about Ayaka's journey, which received four awards at the Durban Four March due to its powerful and impactful subject matter. So we welcome Ayaka. Do you want to come on screen quickly? Hi, Lee. Welcome. I know that you're having some issues. And so thank you for being here today. We're really excited to have you. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, hi, everyone. Unfortunately, I am experiencing a bit of um, network issues. So I'm going to turn off my video um, to use less bandwidth so you guys can hear me clearly. Um, so yeah. Um, as 
Um, Lisa already introduced me. I'm a climate justice activist. I began my journey of activism about two years ago um, because I saw how badly my community and family was affected by the drought that hit the Western Cape. Um, and I've been mostly protesting on the ground with um, the African Climate Alliance here in Cape Town, um, petitioning the president to actually care about climate injustices that we are facing in South Africa. And that was basically the base of my activism. And then we got into lockdown. Um, and then we were forced as activists to shift to a more digital approach to the whole protesting thing. So we went online protesting and everything like that. Um, but since I was not very active last year because of the pandemic, oh, sorry, this year, because of the pandemic, um, I recently engaged in actually making a social impact future, a feature documentary, which is called The House is Burning. Um, and as Lisa said, um, it's a it's a it's a because of its content it is actually quite powerful in the message of we are portraying um the journey of um, a global south activist in the in the industry um because we see that um, mostly we see that the, the movement or the climate march or everything like that does tend to be um, Eurocentric or people do think it's like a white thing and we want to change that narrative because a lot of people that get affected by climate um, change um, are here in the global south and it's people that are poor and it's people of color and we want to bring that to the table. Um, as we're shooting, um, we're actually currently shooting the trailer right now for the for the documentary um, and we have received quite a bit of funding to actually go forward and shoot the trailer and having a green set um, is quite one of our main focuses um, because we do not want to be hypocritical and we understand how important it is um, to respect the environment and live sustainably. Um, so the House is Burning film crew embodies climate activism, sustainable, sustainability um, because we have a little like our cost for the for the documentary is quite small, um, so we just re decreasing the cost of people traveling from here to there. And every time that we do travel, we try to take the road that uses the le the least amount of carbon emissions. Um, so here in December, we're going to go to the Eastern Cape to actually um, document more about the farm where my mom is living or where I grew up um, and we're going to rather use a car than flying and we have a small cast of three people and when we get to the Eastern Cape we'll always make sure to um, hire local people because um, as um, Liesl has said in her presentation that when it comes to documentary films most of the emissions come from transport accommodation so on and so forth and the good part is that the fact that we're going to the Eastern Cape that are a lot of people that are willing to give out accommodation and it's not cost and it's very environmentally friendly. Um, so that's how we are trying to take an approach to a more sustainable way of actually pursuing our documentary. Um, also things that we are doing is not using plastic bottles on set, um, using re like reusable canteens instead, um, using LED lights um, because of the use less power and using rechargeable batteries. Um, that's one of the most important things that we are using. Um, and yeah, using local crew whenever possible to minimize the, um, the impact, the, the, the amount of people traveling. Um, and just briefly, um, the reason why I decided to actually partake in this documentary um, is because it is really something important for me to do. Like, like I understand that in sectors to set sustainability goals, um, we have to reach them in all sectors, but some sectors um, matter more than others, like power, transport, agriculture, and heavy industry heating um, in climate terms. Um, but when I come to the film industry, I would say that the film industry, the film industry's biggest potential impact is through the power of communication. It's an industry skilled, resourced people and finances. Um, who could, if they want to, could help um, hold unsustainable power to account and to inspire viewers to demand changes where they really matter. Um, and as a founding principle, um, I really do admire the amount of impact that we can create as people of color coming into this industry and showing that the climate movement or the climate 
um, it's, it does not have a face. Like we all have to fight it together and everyone deserves representation. And also the view that if I can do it, then you can do it too. Um, we are planning on using this form as like for awareness, education, and hoping that we can get more investors so that we can use this form as an educational tool in our South African education, education system, because what we always, um, were, were, were petitioning for as the African Climate Alliance is to incorporate more um, climate change based curriculum into our studies in South Africa. So by using this form to incorporate it into our curriculum, it can be a good way of inspiring more young people to actually stand up and become active in society and also know how to live sustainably. Um, lastly, um, I do definitely applaud um, the Green Sets Carbon Calculator. And I do hope that it's a standard practice in the film um, industry because we do have to understand that we have to take um, um, our own approach as Africa. We can't adapt to a Eurocentric approach because it will not relate to us. Um, so I definitely applaud the work that they are doing in the film industry. And I am hoping that there might be a possibility that I get to work with them in future. Um, but that's all I have time for right now because they are literally kicking me out of the class. Um, and it's been quite inspiring to see so many people talking about the film set going green. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for joining us. And once again, we applaud you on the work that you're doing and the stand that you're taking to empower the youth. Um, you guys are the future and it is so important for us to be educating our youth uh, to uh, go green. So thank you very much Ayaka for being here today and I hope you get home safely and that you didn't get into too much trouble with the securities at school. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. We'll definitely catch up with you and we look forward to seeing your documentary. I have seen I'm Greta at the Toronto Film Festival this year and I'm telling you it was something worth watching and it made me really think about life and, and implementing certain things in my daily living. So once again, have a good day. Thank you. Oh, I think she's actually gone. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, next up, we've got um, Ulrico, who founded Habitat XR. Um, he produced the world's first narrative virtual reality wildlife documentary. Following the migration of wildebeest in Kenya, he will speak about the evolution of the film set into the real into virtual reality space and how his form of VR democratizes access to natural beauty. So welcome, uh, Ulrika. Thank you for being thank here. You. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Appreciate uh, you guys inviting me, and, and thanks to, to Fane for, for putting me forward to you guys for this. Um, I have really enjoyed the last two hours of, uh, of the talks and the program. I've certainly learned quite a bit, and uh, I've got some notes on the side here about who I want to connect with, uh, which is basically everybody who's spoken. So I'm going to chat a little bit about what we do as Habitat XR. Um, it's a, uh, you know, I, I can speak about so many different topics uh, for, for a long time just because I, it's just so interesting. So this is kind of a, an overview as to uh, not just kind of how we um, approach low environmental impact filmmaking, but we are filmmakers for impact. Um, so it's kind of trying to be as low on the input side as, you know, as far as impact as possible and then as much impact in terms of uh, attitude and behavior change on the output side of what it is that we do. So I'm just going to take everybody through, um, through what it is that we do. Um, all right, so I'm just going to share my, my preso here quickly. All right. So the first question is, is immersion. So I mean, we are a, we call ourselves an impact-led immersive experiences studio. So the way that we film and the way that we write and the way that we post-produce, the way that we tell stories essentially is very different to traditional forms of media, which live on what we call a, a fixed frame screen. And so I always like to kind of define what emotion is and it, it really is the, the core of what it is that we do and why we do what we do. So, you know, traditionally speaking, you know, this is how we consume content. Uh, we are physically, our bodies are physically disconnected from the device that is actually telling us the story or, or facilitating the story. Um, and for that reason, we believe that you are still disconnected emotionally from the story compared to what is actually possible through immersion. It's, it's not a hard and fast rule. 
Of course, we've all seen absolutely incredible impactful documentaries that have made us laugh and cry. Um, and, uh, you know, for us, it's really about exploring the potential of immersion as a fairly new form of storytelling. And the real difference comes in, in that there's something called telepresence. Um, you know, immersion, a, a telepresence is another word for immersion. What telepresence is, we define it as the mind's belief that the body is physically elsewhere. And so this is normally done through virtual reality. We, uh, we produce virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, holograms, projection mapping, various different tools in a, in a larger tool set that help us create immersion. Um, but the most uh, commonly known form of that is virtual reality, where instead of watching it on a TV, uh, you know, a coffee table away from you, you're watching it on a VR headset and you're able to kind of look around in all directions. Um, and most people who we, who we tend to show our experiences to have never actually seen VR before, certainly not what we call cinematic virtual reality, which is live action. It's real world filmed 360 degree footage that you then watch back in, in that headset. Um, and, you know, I think what's been amazing for us over the last seven or so years since we started producing virtual reality is that the mind is quite willing to suspend disbelief in the current reality um, and accept the new proposed environments as their new kind of current present existence. And that just opens up a whole world as far as how we can uh, change the way that people think uh, and, the way that, and the way that people feel about uh, certain issues. So I'm just going to play this uh, this little clip here. This is a Samsung advert. Samsung is one of the, the manufacturers of VR headsets with, with uh, their mobile devices, actually. But you know, it's it's far better to actually see people experiencing virtual reality than try and explain what kind of impact it can actually have on people. So this is just a really great uh, piece of content. All right. Okay. All right. Here goes nothing. I just use my finger. Got it. Okay. Um, oh. Oh, wow. Wow, I can see everything. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing this part. <laughs> oh, 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 my oh, I shouldn't crush. Oh, that is amazing. <laughs> so beautiful. from being a spectator to a witness. You bear witness and you feel like your physical presence um, allows you to bridge the cognitive gap between things that you might not care about and feeling like it is a very personal issue to you. And that's at the, the kind of the heart and soul of the opportunity of immersive technologies. You know, and we asked why, why does that really matter? And in the greater realm of things, why, why does it matter? And, and what are the, the specific things going on that um, you know, we're kind of aiming toward in order to make this, this impact using this form of filmmaking and storytelling. So the first one is a, it's a physiological thing. And so studies coming out of various different places, including from Stanford uh, and their uh, virtual human interaction lab, they, they're doing clinical studies about the power of immersion. And fortunately, they've done many as far as uh, nature and the environment itself. So that's, that's the subject matter that we focus on. We do environmental storytelling um, you know, we focus on, on nature, on species, uh, on climate science, things like that. And what we know from all of these studies is that the greater the, the degree of immersion, the greater the experience of empathy. And there's a specific kind of empathy that we're very interested in, which is called inclusion of nature in self or INS. So we know that the more immersed a person feels, the more INS they experience. And this is something that is measured through various different forms uh, of, of monitoring, including uh, EEG brain scans, so you can, you can tell what the person is feeling, what areas of the brain light up, galvanic skin response, heart rate, breathing, um, you know, this is all science informed. And what we know is that when a person experiences a higher state of inclusion in nature of self, they are far more willing, far more likely to uh, experience attitude and behavior changes, which we believe as a company is just what we 
so critically need to do. Fain just hit so many great notes about uh, hyper-consumerism, um, you know, and, and the kind of attitudes that we have as one species of uh, many species in this ecosystem. And so we, we see immersive storytelling as a way to um, start affecting a little bit more of a, um, a, a true perspective on our own role in nature. The second reason why it matters is because, um, and Lisa mentioned this in the, in the introduction, and that is that uh, access to nature is incredibly difficult. And so, you know, I've, I've got this wonderful privilege of having grown up in South Africa where A, we've got incredible access to nature in, in the form of the parks and the game reserves around us, um, but that's not the case for everybody. And so there is still a financial aspect of access uh, and, um, and, you know, we protected areas are, are shrinking all the time. They're, they're fewer and fewer than they have ever been um, in, in kind of a healthy natural state. And so the power of VR, what we're designing it to do in our own kind of ways and implementation is that we're trying to replicate what it is that we as individual team members have got to experience through nature as we've grown up. I have fallen in love with it. I try and live a very environmentally conscious life because of the privilege I've had in terms of that access. So the phrase democratizing access to nature is an incredibly important thing for us. Um, putting on that headset, even in the form of what you're looking at on, on screen here, which is uh, called a Google Cardboard and it works with your own cell phone, is an incredibly powerful experience. Uh, and, and the amazing thing is that we can have more people um, bearing witness to nature as if they were physically there without increasing any of the ecological uh, footprint or limits. And I'll, I'll touch on that just a little bit later too. Um, so just kind of touching on why it is that we, uh, or, or how, the, how we actually go about filming it. So a lot like the Sea Change project team, uh, we, we travel really light and really small. This is the, the biggest our crews ever get. Typically, uh, we are two members in the film crew. Um, maybe three, depending on, on what it is and where it is. And pretty much everything you see there is, is the equipment. So we travel in back with backpacks. Uh, we do not have hard cases on our shoots. Uh, a, for, for um, you know, carbon footprints. Uh, B, because we're going to remote places and, and obviously it doesn't serve us to have a ton of gear. So, um, you know, obviously we do need to fly into specific places. We are going to uh, these wild remote wildernesses in order to capture it in a very kind of honest way, um, in order to bring it back to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, hopefully even millions of people so that they can experience what it is we, we experience. So we do take uh, our, our carbon footprints very seriously, um, but for us, it's also an equation that is how do we send three, four people into this remote area, um, but then divide the footprint across the number of people who get to feel like they've, they've witnessed that their minds feel like they've physically been to these areas themselves. Um, and we, I mean, we'll even pack things like this massive drone. This is a 1.2 meter wingspan drone, uh, which unfortunately we need a drone that big to carry the cameras that we have, which are pretty hefty. Um, I'll show you those in a second, but we'll fit a drone like that. We'll completely dismantle the drone, put it into backpacks and fly like that. The other thing that we are very serious about and have quite strong, strong opinions about is um, manipulation of nature. So we, as a company, will not film captive animals. Um, and uh, we think that it's just very important that there is a congruency um, in terms of what it is that's actually filmed in the story that we're telling. So you look at a beautiful macro fly like this, you know, in, in a multitude of documentaries, uh, won't name and share many broadcasters, but you know, you, you'll often just sit there and say, how did they get that? How did they get these two uh, rhino beetles mating, you know, in the middle of a jungle? Um, you know, when you watch the behind the scenes, this is what you'll see. This is actually a, a little barn studio in, you know, back end uh, Bristol somewhere. And um, I've got a little bit of a problem with it uh, from a kind of an ethics point of view. So for us, there is the, the hard and fast environmental impact, um, but there's also kind of the ethics of how we film and what we film. And the way that we film is very, very difficult. Uh, it's, we, we can't sit on the back of, of a game drive vehicle, for example, and, and film it with a beautiful long lens, the action across the, across the river. Um, this is a 360 degree camera. This is our, our main workhorse. It's an Insta360 Titan. So it's made up of eight individual lenses. Those eight lenses point in all directions, 360 degrees, up, down, so that the viewer, when they're watching in goggles, essentially takes the place of where that, that camera was. What it means is that you need action happening very, very in very close proximity to the camera. Typically, 
uh, about three meters, four meters from that camera. So it's a very difficult way to actually get shots. <clears throat> but this is kind of a, an example of one of these, uh, these cameras. So, I mean, they're freestanding cameras, so we don't stand there, uh, you know, and operate them. Uh, most of the time, we actually try film on foot. So it sounds like, again, kind of like the sea change guys, we, we do try and uh, minimize the, the, the use of vehicles. So we've got members in our team that are trails guides, they're Pogasa qualified trails guides that, you know, they used to take tourists out on foot to these big park reserves and keep them safe, make sure they don't get mauled, gored or stampeded. Uh, we've got members like that in our team uh, and, and where we go out to specific areas, we, we tend to partner with the local field guides um, so that we can operate on foot. Uh, it allows us to get a lot more connected to our environment, understand behavior, understand the, uh, the ecology of that environment. And our footprint is literally the size of our, our own footprints. The cameras are then freestanding. So we will try and predict the behavior of an animal and place the camera down where we think that animal is going to do something interesting. So in this particular case, it was a very, very sunny day, uh, very little shade anywhere else. Then we saw this leopard walking from uh, really far away, place the camera in the shade, anticipating that in the middle of the day, it's going to go and uh, relax in that shade. And we managed to get an incredible shot. And so, you know, because it's such an honest form of filmmaking, there's no real way that we can, uh, we can fake that. We don't bait animals, uh, you know, we, we tend to, to kind of just let that happen. So prediction is really a big part of our, um, of our role uh, and our job. And when we get really, really lucky, uh, we managed to capture things that have, have never been captured before and certainly not in this way. So this was uh, almost a year to the day ago, actually. I think this might have been two days from now last year. Uh, this is 16 and a half thousand feet up in the uh, Himalaya mountains in northern India. This is three snow leopards, uh, a mother and two cubs that we managed, managed to capture um, almost purely by luck. Um, but this is the kind of thing that you'll see in a headset and it's the kind of thing that you will not be able to see if you go on safari. It's, you will not be able to see this if you go out to the Himalayas. Um, you know, it, you'll be very lucky to see leopards in, in binoculars a thousand meters away. So having this nose-to-nose -nose moment with these snow leopards, you know, in 3D, 360, um, for those of you who've, who've ever experienced anything like that, you know the sense of uh, kind of privilege that just washes through your body feeling that you've seen something that, um, you know, is just this once in a lifetime kind of experience. Um, I've, I've got a video here that I'm going to play, um, which, uh, sorry, it's just a trailer for a new uh, documentary, which is really the... The, the founding story of Habitat XR. So this has just been released on Showmax. Um, so I'll just play this trailer, but it gives you a bit of an insight as to how it is that we film on foot with the cameras and the, the deployments look like, and also what it is that we deal with from technical issues point of view. To film in this kind of way is something else, man. That's why no one's done it. That's why no one's done it. <laughs> Boom, here we are in the Masai Mara. Our goal was to come here for as little as 10 days and just see what we could get and hopefully put that into a documentary. And it's harder in VR. It's a whole lot harder in VR to do that. I thought it would be hard, but maybe not this hard. It's one thing to sit back with the camera and actually film it from the side, where what we're doing is uh, it's in the action. It's, it's the real deal. We were developing equipment to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish because no one really is developing it yet. We basically were field testing something at the same time that we were trying to capture a project, which means we are constantly in troubleshooting mode. It wasn't chicken, it wasn't recording. And throughout the entirety of the shoot, we never really left troubleshooting mode. One of our main two cameras stopped working. It just straight up won't power on. We had two drones go down. We had a, a camera drop down and broke that rig. Cameras jamming up and the operating systems being unresponsive. Can we get out of the vehicle? Can't we? Do we have permission? Don't we have permission? Our fixers pretty much just dropped us. Three of the crew members are down and sick this morning. As he came around the corner, put his horns down, trying to get me. Good shots, adrenaline going. 
I mean, it was issue after issue after issue after issue, but you don't really have any choice but to fight. You don't really have any choice but to keep swinging through all the problems because you're here. I'm just gonna uh, skip through this um, for the interest of time, uh, but I just wanna talk very quickly about what we call weaponizing immersion for impact. And so this is how we use it. So that's what you've seen now is sort of how we go out there. We film it, uh, it goes through post-production. What's really important is to understand how it is that this kind of stuff lands up getting used for impact. And so what we do is we partner with conservation nonprofits who, who are doing the actual field work. In most cases, um, we're, we're using it as a fundraising tool. So often these, these uh, NGOs will have gala, some sort of fundraising event. Uh, we're doing distributed events now in, in the pandemic era, uh, but we work with them to, to essentially put empathy on steroids and allow people to truly understand what it is that these NGOs stand for, the kind of work that they're doing uh, in the field. Because photos and videos alone don't often do that, and that's often what's being used at these, um, at these fundraising galas in the past. So uh, we did some work with, uh, with Ellen DeGeneres and her Ellen Fund, which operates out in Rwanda. Uh, they, they partnered up with the Dying Fossey Growth Fund, and they are there to save mountain gorillas. So I'll just tell you, I'll play this for a few seconds to give you some context as to how we use this. How many of you got to experience the virtual reality thing back there? Isn't it incredible? It's like you're with the gorillas, and after the show, they're going to wait, and you can do it again if you missed it. You have to do it. It's a great experience, and it'll make you want to go to Rwanda and see the gorillas. Because you probably remember a couple of years ago, Portia gave me the best birthday present ever. She started the Ellen DeGeneres Wildlife Fund to help save the mountain gorillas in Rwanda. And this past Saturday night, we threw a huge fundraiser. We called it Gorilla Palooza. And uh, it was a big deal for me, because there are only two things that can get me out of the house on a Saturday night. That is helping animals or an open bar. Um, so, so that's really what it was. It was a single evening. We had a whole bunch of these VR headsets with gorillas that we had filmed out in Rwanda. And it was just an ambient experience. So not even any storytelling. Uh, just beautiful surround sound audio and this 360 degree uh, footage of essentially you hanging out with wild mountain gorillas. So just to end with, um, that night they raised $5 million for, for gorillas. So typically the work that we do results in something between 6 to 1 and 10 to 1 ROI. So touch wood, we've never had a situation where it cost more money for the client um, than it did in terms of fundraising, which is really just incredible and testament to the immersion and, and, and what it is that people feel. Um, after the event happened, uh, we decided that we would get in touch with all the, the VR distributors, so Oculus and HTC and all these companies to release the footage of the gorillas, the, the six minute ambient experience to all of them for Earth Day as a promoted thing. Um, and obviously tapping into the fact that VR headsets are not household devices, but there are still several million people who own them around the world. And so we put that out there um, as a way to, to give people that experience. And to date, we've had 300,000 people watch it in a VR headset. And what's really interesting to me is that in Volcanoes National Park in Northern Rwanda, they limit permits to about 29,000 permits uh, per year. So only 29,000 people can check those gorillas. So what that means, is based on the ecological limits of the park itself, those, those limits imposed, it would take 10 years to give that number of people uh, the sense that they've been around wild mountain gorillas. Um, so we don't know exactly who those 300,000 people are per se, but it's a very interesting uh, idea around, um, around what impact can do it and what this democratization of access to nature kind of looks like in, in the greatest, greatest scheme. So that is me, uh, and yeah, happy to take questions. We'll hang around for those. That is amazing work that you're doing already. It was very interesting, and congratulations on your impact filmmaking and reaching and telling people the stories that needs to be told and raising an awareness about saving our animals. Um, I just, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. I would love to see it. Um, so I'll take this offline and arrange some time to actually get to see it. Um, we are to our last speaker. Um, I'm now going to introduce Dioni, uh, who is the founder of Ocean Pledge, which is an amazing ocean conservation organization. And Dioni will speak about their journey in making events and spaces plastic free. 
Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, I am very honored to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. This is the second West Grow talk that I've been at in the last week. And what inspires me so much, the last talk was all about sustainability within the wine industry. And now it's the movie industry, both industries that I actually know nothing about. But I get so excited that this is the narrative that is being held now across all these genres. Um, I'm also completely inspired by all the speaking that I've heard so far, because indeed, it's not just what happens on set, it's the impact of our communication. And what I've been seeing from Habitat just makes my mind absolutely go at what the potential is here to reconnect that divide that we have between self and nature. As Fane was talking about, it's this schism that has left us so far apart from our ability to connect with everything that is part of us that is leaving us in this mess that we are today. So um, my name is Dione, I am a mother, I am an ocean addict and I'm a research psychologist. I have had a lifetime of the most amazing ocean experiences passed down to me from my mother who I used to go swimming with in the sunrise every single morning at six o'clock, swimming with dolphins, playing around in the champagne of frothy waves. And I hope as a mother to be able to pass on the amazing experiences that I've had in swimming with dolphins and whale sharks to my two little girls. But in the 20 years of researching, everything that makes consumers buy more stuff and looking at the world around us, I realized that this dream is not always uh, an imminent reality and that we really need to do things to, um, to make this change and to be part of this change. So I'm just going to share my slides with you. I hope you're seeing what I'm seeing. Um, are you? Can somebody just- Yes, we are. Thank you. We are. are you seeing the Wavescape Masterclass slide? Yes, we are, Diani. We are. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. so. Just so that we understand where we are in terms of ocean plastic, because this is a big thing for me, being in love with the ocean and understanding how to preserve it. Uh, South Africa has been ranked as the 11th largest contributor to ocean plastic. And this is part in combination because so many people in our country don't have access to formal waste collection. And also because we have this unique situation where we've got oceans on both sides of our country and 15 huge extensive river basins that carry all of our dramas and our behaviors inland to the ocean. They've done a longitudinal scientific studies to try and understand what's going on. What is all the trash that we're finding on our beaches? And the big finding is that 95% of the plastic in the ocean comes from land-based sources. In other words, from what we are choosing to do every day. 94% of all the trash on South African beaches is plastic and 77% of that is packaging waste. These are the daily decisions that we make every day. And according to the latest stats that we have from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, if we carry on with business as usual, we're gonna have 4 billion people on the planet by 2040 that don't have access to formal waste collection. And the amount of plastic in the, that we find in the ocean now is going to be four times the amount by 2040. So to give you a picture of what that looks like, imagine 50 kilograms of plastic on every single meter of every single beach and every single coastline right around the world. This is no joke. Then add to that the reality of COVID and everything gets flipped on its head. All of a sudden, we've got millions of little hand sanitizer bottles. We've got the single use plastic masks, which we are finding in all our oceans right now. Plastic packaging is all of a sudden the go-to thing, quite erroneously, in fact, thinking that everything is now safer and more hygienic. Let's package our bananas in plastic. And it is just a mess. And good habits that have taken ages to replace have now been turned on their heads, putting us about 15 years back in terms of um, good plastic-free behaviors. So I've been asked today to come and tell you a little bit about the story of Ocean Lynch. Now it started for me. So when I turned 40, I decided to put my big girl panties on and do things in life that scared me. And part of that was surfing and surfing at the competitions. And before I knew what was actually happening, I was invited to serve SA Champs in Durban in 2017. 
And I arrived at the surfing competition and what really occurred to me was that every single day, this huge truck full of little tiny plastic water bottles were being dished out to all the ocean loving athletes who weren't even thinking twice about it. They were just happy to get water. And I thought, gosh, this is ironic. I thought I have to do something about this today. So I made a pledge in 2017 that never again would I buy a plastic water bottle. And I haven't. And it wasn't actually so hard. All I needed to do was get into a new habit and I had to inconvenience myself a little bit from time to time to come to a place where I've always got a, 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 a reusable bottle. It's not that hard. But two things I'd like to share to you, with you about that pledge. Firstly, taking a pledge, making one small change at a time has got a ripple effect because all of a sudden my eyes opened up to all these other little plastic behaviors that I had like plastic packets, earbuds, um, the toothbrush I used. There were so many things that then started changing in my life. And secondly, the impact it had for others around me who started asking questions and noticing why was I carrying, putting all my things individually into the car from my trolley when I'd left my reusable bags at home. And I thought, well, there's power in this pledge. So I started getting pledges from everyone around me. I started with the surfing community I was lucky enough to get a pledge from John John Florence, who was the big uh, surf champion um, in those days, and our legend, Sean, Tom uh, Sean Thompson, and even, what's his name, Ben, ben Harper signed uh, his pledge. And it's then, since then, the organization has grown, and we're now really all about turning awareness into action, because we believe that we can save the world by just implementing one small change at a time. So now we work with individuals, we work with schools, we work with organizations, and we have, we are very uh, lucky to be the beneficiary for Wavescape who support us every year very kindly. And yeah, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the journey ahead. So I'm by no means an expert, as I mentioned, or in the film industry, but my message today is it doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter what industry you are in and in your life in general, it's about starting small. It's about making those small little cumulative actions, which over time really start changing our paradigms and how we see the world. And that starts becoming a powerful wave of change. So just to give you our first project in Ocean Pledge was to make sure that the next surfing event, the next SA Champs, was going to be single use plastic free. So we went up to Lambert's Bay. It wasn't me. It wasn't we in those days. It was me. And I started working with a local community who had never seen anything other than a polystyrene coffee cup and trying to get them on board and working with the event organizers, trying to get guidelines together for the organizers around how to deal with waste, how to deal with water. And I think Liesl said it up front, you know, it doesn't always have to be the most costly solution. We were pulling water off the mountain and going with big um, canisters and making water tables. All of a sudden there were no more plastic water bottles that, were, that we were responsible for. And we looked at um, the waste, we looked at the, um, the participants as well. We've got over here. I mean, one thing that stood out for me is like the production industry. There's so many partners that make these things actually successful. And communication is such an important part to get everyone playing in this field. It's all about how we communicate things on all these different levels to all the diff different departments so that we can work together to make things happen. One of the things that we learned as well, uh, yeah, and a lot of education around bioplastics and why that's not necessarily always a good example to uh, as a sustainable solution, because of course with bioplastics, you do need an industrial composter that is set at a standard temperature of 60 degrees plus every single day. And in South Africa, we don't have that infrastructure. So we were educating ourselves all, uh, all along while we're educating others. Um, we also realized that there were sponsors involved in this. I mean, we were at a, doing a beach cleanup for, or a, a, an engagement with the sustainability partners for a surfing event and everything was going swimmingly. We had our guidelines for our vendors in place. We had the guidelines for the organizers in place only to realize that the sponsors add a whole nother element. So while everything was going well on the beach, 
all of a sudden at four o'clock, the beach was covered with these little red plastic beer cups. We hadn't considered that the sponsors also need to be spoken to. So this is again, this multi-pronged approach on how we talk to everybody to get them to play the same game. And of course, there's the reporting. Um, the reporting is very important because reporting not only measures change over time and shows the impact, but it helps to highlight where we can make improvements. So we made a lot of improvement a lot of the time with some of the sponsors who were initially dishing out little plastic lip ices to their CSI kids. And we managed to talk to them and work with them so that they would come back and then they went for a slightly more sustainable, albeit still plastic solution of Frisbees, which at least is not that single use thing that's gonna land up in the sand. And from surfing events, we then went on to working with restaurants. So our Ocean Pledge restaurant program was a way that we thought we could tackle waste upstream while at the same time uh, using this as an opportunity to educate not only the restaurant industry, but the patrons as well. So we started with the restaurant program, which is all about encouraging and promoting and marketing the restaurants that are moving away from the cheap non-disposable forms of single-use plastic or disposable forms but non-recyclable forms of single-use plastic and we monitor and track these changes through the technology and of course it also includes a lot of behavior change programs and i'll show you how we do that so the first thing that the restaurants need to do is come on board these very easy to implement criteria and these are no plastic or pla straws that all disposable utensils are made out of bamboo because ours is always like, how is this gonna behave when it lands up in the ocean? And unfortunately the PLA alternatives, which I saw on set the other day, are not the answer because they are gonna be around for a long time. No expanded polystyrene, that's the stuff that breaks into a million little tiny bits of plastic that once it lands up in the ocean, we can never retrieve. Obviously no plastic packets and no little sweets at the end of the bowl. Uh, and all of these findings we have done through extensive market research, working with WWF and working with business holders to find out what works in South Africa, considering the infrastructure challenges we have. With, so once the restaurant decides to come on board with us, uh, we give them our Ocean Pre Pledge approved logo, which they can then share with their audiences so they can show them the, the steps that they're taking towards a more sustainable future and they get put onto an interactive Google map that wherever you're going, you're able to see who are the ocean friendly uh, establishments in that area. One of the big things, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, the education. So the greatest way that a program like the Ocean Place Restaurant Program might fail is because there's a very high staff turnover in the restaurant industry. So we thought, well, to make it work, we really need to get the staff on board, but we can't always be there. So our fabulous documentary maker, Mark van Veek, said, okay, well, how are we gonna communicate this in a way that's not boring? We don't want to overwhelm people. We don't want to bore them with all the hardcore facts. We need to make it interesting. So I would like to show you one of the clips we've done three so far, where we're trying to make the education around the criteria for these programs a little bit more engaging and, uh, and, and brought to life in a way that you want to maybe even share this information with those around you. So I'm going to just stop sharing so that Lisa can share that uh, slide. Um, excuse me, sorry. Um, is it too much to ask for a straw? I'm actually paying for all of this. Uh oh, here we go. Of course, sir. Thank you. Can I offer you one of our ocean plates pasta straws, sir? We don't do plastics anymore. Seriously? I suppose you don't vaccinate either. Okay, wow. Luckily, I'm naturally immune to rudeness. Plastic straws can take hundreds of years to disintegrate, sir. Imagine the damage it can cause to whales, dolphins, and seagulls and things. Jeez, it's just a little straw, okay? And you are just a little... Well, 
If seven billion people said that, sir, then there would be seven billion straws thrown away every single time someone orders a drink. Well, why don't you just use biodegradable straws like all the other places did? I'd be surprised if those places let you in. Biodegradable straws takes years to disintegrate in the ocean, sir. And that means years of killing whales and dolphins and tuna fish. Why should I care about tuna fish? I just want a straw. That's not a BLT you ordered, remember? Help yourself. What? And now my drink's gonna taste like macaroni and cheese? Too bad there's no vaccination against stupid. <laughs> a good one, sir. But I bet you my tip it won't. Fine. Let's bet your tip. Pasta. Yup. And you can even nibble as you go. Sure. Anything else, sir? Yeah, come on. Get another one. Yeah. Enjoy your tuna mayo sandwich. Millions of fish, seabirds, mammals, and reptiles die every year after eating plastic straws. Plastic straws cannot be recycled. They can remain in the environment for 500 years or more. So-called biodegradable straws need very specific controlled environments in order to degrade. If customers insist on a straw, offer them alternatives made of pasta, paper, glass or bamboo. Let's all work together to protect our oceans by reducing single-use plastics. Thank you. Yeah, back to the slides. Okay, so that's basically what we have lined up. Uh, we've got, we've done three of our criteria, but we've got an ongoing list of criteria. It's not just those five you saw. It's about restaurants uh, choosing to use sustainably sourced seafood or going to pledging to go local and seasonal. And I guess all of these uh, kinds of goals are relevant for the movie industry too. And a lot of steps are being taken. I'm very excited about, I mean, I was looking at the Spider-Man 2, that seems to be the greenest movie that was ever made. I, I read a story about how New York is very, uh, very conscious about which movies are sustainable and they hand out guides to uh, more sustainable forms of transport, uh, paint that is safer to use, all kinds of guides probably around uh, the accommodation and all factors that make New York, or at least it's easier for, for people to access going green. And even in South Africa, um, it's amazing to see that green sectors doing what they're doing and that Rap Zero is coming on board. I actually had no idea about this. It's very, very encouraging. It's about the little steps we take. And just by committing to do one thing at a time, whether it's taking plastic water bottles off, seat, off the set, that's a huge step in the right direction. Each person is drinking at least three to four or 500 more bottles a day. And it doesn't always have to be the most expensive cost. Even though some of these things are costly, it's about dishing out them out only when they're needed. And it's about communicating properly to get everyone on board, to tell them to bring their reusable bottle, to tell them to bring their reusable masks rather than handing out the single use stuff. Yeah, I feel very encouraged. And I know that COVID has put a big spanner in the works. I understand that all of a sudden it's set, all the cutlery has to be uh, wrapped individually, all the little food parcels need to come individually wrapped, but there's also ways of going about that. So rather than having three kinds of meals, put all your meals in one, make it one packaging, try to stick to cardboard boxes rather than all the plastic. I mean, table props, I heard about them, they're also not using, they're not ever buying bubble wrap. They only use the bubble wrap that they, it gets donated to them by the arts department. What a wonderful thing. That has so much impact in itself. Mornay von Staden from the Green Frame Sets, he's able to reduce as much as 40% of the set building costs because he's got over 50 wall flats that he's already built that are ready to be used and reused again. 
So I think it's always about just looking at what you're engaging with, what are you purchasing, trying to understand where it's going to end up after this shoot, and how can we commit to doing things slightly differently. And you don't have to be perfect. It's the quest for the silver bullet can often stand in the way. It's about the little gestures that we make that represent the start of ecological transformation. It's that ripple effect that one little action can do when it spreads out in, in ever increasing circles. So once the philosophy gets into the mindset of the film crew, they're then likely to go home and implement it at home and they're likely to remember it the next time they get to a film set. And so it is that culture change starts happening. Thank you very much for listening to me today. I'm very excited to hear some of the questions that are coming up and, and learn from the rest of the panelists too. Dianne, if you want me to bring up your last video quickly? Yes, please. Okay, cool. We'll do. there is no such thing as waste. In the name of progress and convenience, we have become a throwaway society. Humans are the only species on this planet to produce something that nature cannot digest. The ocean is the source of so much life it generates 50% of the oxygen we breathe. That's every second breath we take. Without her, we are lost. Ocean Pledge is committed to ending plastic pollution through the power of individual choice. Our commitment is based upon our principles of care. of Sir David Attenborough, for the first time in 500 million years, one species has the future in the palm of its hands. Every single choice we make has an impact. And like infinite drops in the ocean rising in a powerful wave, together we can co-create the tide of change. Thank you, Lisa. So inspiring. Um, I'd just like to invite all the panelists to come on screen. I know we're kind of running out of time. We've only got like two minutes left. But um, I just would like to say to everybody that um, creating consciousness through all the work, I think that we all do collectively, like your video said, like, like you spoke about, Tiani, is so important. Um, I recently moved back to my neighborhood where, which I grew up in and there's parts of the area that is strewn with litter and there's also a very, very poor community next door and often on bin day, you know, people are scratching around in bins, obviously looking for recycled stuff. 
So I said in our community chat, look, come on, guys, instead of people digging up, you know, let's be conscious of what we can put aside to give back to those people to recycle so that they can make some money to get that bread or whatever it is that they need. And I think when we start thinking about um, what initiatives we can do in our environments and our communities to help each other, um, it's a win-win situation. And I think that we always have to be mindful of it. And for those who are making impactful documentaries and st telling stories and so forth, it's so important. We need you guys and we obviously need to grow our industry to tell more as we go along. So I see that we don't have many um, uh, questions. Um, there is some, somebody said super inspiring. Thank you all so much for giving me a little extra motivation as I'm about to start my green consultant business. So well done to you for starting your green consultancy business. Um, connect with all of us on screen. I encourage the speakers to drop your email addresses in the chat group so people can get in contact with you. And then I'm going to give everybody an opportunity just to say, if you've got a question, tons, but I don't think we've got time to go through all of it. There's just one thing that I wanted to note. Um, Westro, I mean, our mandate is to promote the film industry, the media industry, and uh, we also quite good at connecting the dots. And so obviously sustainability is a big part of what we do. The one thing that I want Liesl and uh, Cindy to speak about, and Dione mentioned it towards the end of her presentation, is that there is um, an advantage to our green seats becoming um, green. And what that means to our competitiveness as a destination or as a film destination. So if you could just give a little bit of feedback to the, to, um, our audience about how important it is for us to start making that change and that it actually has a massive impact on our, our, our um, competitiveness. So I'll give you all a minute to say something and then we're going to wrap up the session. Okay, thanks. Um, we'll start with uh, Liesl. Okay, I think it's basically, I mean, when we started doing this about three and a half years ago, we realized that we were already about five Five, between five and ten years behind um, some of the some of the other re film regions in the world, in terms of what they were doing for sustainable, in terms of of not just policy but also the practice of sustainability. Um, so we immediately got stuck in, and I think what's been very encouraging is that on the projects that we've worked on, we've really seen some innovation as well. So if your process is correct and you and you really engage um, if if you start out correctly and you've got and you've got appropriate targets and all of that and a strategy and policies and you really engage all the crew and cost, um, you'll be amazed at what comes out um, of that entire group and that can take things much further than what you can do. So it's so your role is also very much to 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 manage that process and I think that but we've been able to show that even though we were late to the game, um, we've actually leapfrogged in certain ways. So I think it's definitely, we've managed to show that we can do, uh, we can do sustainable production as well as any of the, of, of sort of the more leading or more experienced um, regions, if you can call it that. And maybe as an example, we've done quite a bit of work, as I mentioned with the case in Film Commission, and we've actually now wrapped zero in the case in film commission are finalists in the sustainability category of the inaugural makers and shakers award which is an international film award so please hold thumbs for us 14th of december but it's just an example that we can show you know we don't we don't have to stand back super we're not going to stand back we're going to spread the word spread the word spread the word Cindy, um, just quickly, also just, just indicated what stage in production do you guys get involved with producers? And then you can just wrap up. So we get involved um, basically prior pre-production because we find um, and train eco stewards and prepare them to go on to set. And by the time a production is ready to get into the pre-production phase, our eco stewards are ready and start along with all the vital departments to make sure that we're getting 
systems in place to not only capture the data, but to also reach each and every crew member as they get on board so that the entire production is filled with people who know what's going on and who want to make an impact. That's amazing, thank you. Uh, Ulrika? Do you wanna just uh, say? Those yeah, Lisa, ones? just go ahead. Sorry, I missed the question actually. Uh, audio broke up a bit. They just, I was gonna just ask you if you've got any questions, if you have any closing words. Um, well, I think that uh, echoing a lot of the sentiments that have been said is that, you know, we as an industry don't have to uh, be behind the times in any way. In, in many cases, you know, we, especially as a country, have, have a lot more to, to save and protect um, than, than many other uh, countries. And so, yeah, I think that, um, you know, conservation as a, as a term is um, something that we think about often. Um, and often thinking about replacing that term with proliferation. I think for us, it's not just about saving what it is that we have in its existing form, it's helping it kind of grow back. And um, these industries are just a critical part of doing that and leading the, the kind of the thought leadership and the change that has to happen. Um, it's not about you know, doing good and feeling good, it's about how we as a species can learn to cooperate with our environment for our own continued existence. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Brenda, some closing words? Um, this has been quite an eye opener and it's quite encouraging to actually see that there's a lot that be, that's being done in terms of making sure that the filmmaking industry is, um, is, have, is reducing its, its carbon footprint. And, and I think like Ayaka said, the power of filmmaking, it's not just the fact that you can just watch a movie, it's the message in it um, and, and, and how that message gets spread across to make sure that it reaches people that it wouldn't ordinarily do so. So, so I, we do hope to see more films that, that, that highlight the need for, for us as consumers to, to, to also be aware of our own impact and films that also um, um, uh, kind of embody that, that, that vision of, of, of um, uh, uh, low impact in, 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 in its production. So um, this was quite encouraging. And I think, yes, let's, let's, let's do more. Let's take this a little bit further. Let's scale it, let's take this message to school. Let's create a groundswell of young children who are, young people rather who are aware and who, who, who will then inherit this world responsibly. Thank you so much. Even though I was not much part of this, I was just standing in for Ayaka in case something went wrong. Um, I, quite, I learned a lot today. So thank you. Thank you to everyone. It's been an I Thank you, Brin. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and then Diony, last, and you're quite a, a storyteller. So I think you're quite entertaining today. <laughs> so. Well, there's not too much more that I can add to all the sentiments, but I'd like to echo Uruko, and we have got such unbelievable natural resources. That's why people come here. They want to be part of it. They want to use what we've got. We have got absolutely every single right to make sure that it's protected, because if it wasn't for our resources being protected, we wouldn't be filming here in the first place. So an eco fee, adding that on, I think it goes without saying, it has to happen. You know, some of the challenges that we had in Ocean Pledge, especially when we were doing the, uh, the, the, the work with the, with the surfing contests, is the fact that this stuff is not mandated by law. I mean, how is it even allowed that you're bringing plastic bottles onto the beach, right? So it is so important that right now we make the changes that we need to because we don't have time to waste anymore. You know, we've got a yucca standing there. And thank heavens for our youth. We are now going to have to give our youth a planet. And we're going to have to tell them why we've made such a cock up of it. So it's really important right now that we do our bit. Going back to what Liesl said, yes, we might have started too late, but it's certainly not too late to start. I think we've got so many amazing creative people and unbelievable minds and the innovation that I saw coming out with Habitat. We really have an opportunity now to teach, to communicate, to educate, and to send a message out there that 
can really make a difference. So I'm very inspired by everyone that I've heard today. And I thank you all for the learnings that I take. Uh, there's a lot of hope after today's session. Thank you. So thank you, Gianni, and thank you to everybody that um, attended today. A special thank you to all our guests. Um, and if you need to get into contact with our guests or with Westgrove's Film and Media Unit, you're more than welcome to email me on lisa at westgrove.co.za. Um, the session has been recorded and what we normally do afterwards, because what we notice is sometimes people don't attend, lots of people attend the session, but what happens is that when it's on the shelf, we market it to our databases and so forth. And there's a whole lot more people that actually watches it in their um, spare time. So once again, thank you so much and have a, um, have a wonderful day further. <laughs> thank you. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Thank you.